Okay. Hi, Angelina. <laughs> Hi, Alpha. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, the difference between gray infrastructure and green infrastructure and how it helps the water cycle? Sure. So gray infrastructure refers to the built aspects of any given water system. So these include anything from pipes and spring boxes to wells or dams. It's the, the gray infrastructure refers to the built aspects of our watershed and water delivery systems. Um, whereas the green infrastructure refers to the natural aspects of our water systems, which include everything from forests and wetlands to rivers and um, just the, the riparian zone. So uh, as these uh, green and gray infrastructure, it's important to consider both of these elements of a watershed the state of California tends to, uh, in their uh, legislation that provides funding for water security, the state has in the past devoted most of that funding towards gray infrastructure improvements. And as this drought is becoming so incessant and extreme, we're starting to see that you can't build yourself out of a, a water crisis, that eventually you have to understand what, nat what natural components in our water system are providing the clean, cold, fresh water uh, for free, which nature has done since the beginning of time. Um, so can you give a particular instance of a green infrastructure versus a gray infrastructure and how the green might be more advantageous? Uh, sure, so um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so green, um, so a great, okay. So take a community, a small community like mine, for example, I live in the town of McLeod, California and we are uh, entirely reliant on volcanic springs to provide our fresh water supply. Our town has three dedicated spring sources and we don't have a single well, which is actually very rare in the state anymore to have a completely, a community that's completely reliant on spring fed, a, a gravity fed spring supply. Um, and up until recently, our spring productivity has been relatively stable, uh, even in the face of dwindling snow pack. And we had this understanding that um, that our volcan Mount at the McLeod is at the base of Mount Shasta, and so we have volcanic aquifers that we felt were, we thought were relatively uh, resilient in the face of dwindling snowpack, reduced precipitation and climate change. But just last year, our spring productivity went down in all three of our springs by more than half. And so all of a sudden our springs are not, our water system is not as secure as we thought it was. So, a gray infrastructure uh, solution would be to dig a well and draw, you know, start sucking groundwater up from the from who knows how deep in the earth to uh, deliver to the water system. Whereas a green infrastructure solution would entail um, alpine meadow restoration, beaver reintroduction. Uh, and resilient forestry practices above, above the springs that supply our town. Um, does that make sense? Can you explain how those things increase the spring production? Uh, just by uh, improving the rate at which water uh, is stored, percolates into the ground, or percolates into the ground, which then feeds the springs. Um, so current like um, conventional forest practices 
remove all the vegetative um, species in the up uh, in the upper watershed or like um, a relic dam which is kind of uh, disrupting the natural hydrological flow um, and then of course um, California has a huge legacy of kind of draining our wetlands so these uh, by restoring our wetlands and restoring our healthy forests, the upper watershed can store snowpack, it can um, naturally filter and purify the water. And uh, it just creates more of that natural hydrological cycle that humanity has relied on uh, since communities existed. So it's, um, and it's also conservation. It's, it's behavioral modification so that we're not taking, we're not wasting water. We're actually conserving water and using it very sparingly. Uh, a lot of communities such as, forest communities such as uh, the ones located at the base of Mount Shasta, we're used to such uh, water um, abundance that we've developed honestly very um, wasteful water practices. And so there's behavioral and natural solutions to minimize our exposure to drought. Uh, but these behavioral and natural solutions are not the ones that get funded. It's, the, it's only the gray infrastructure or the built aspects of our water practices that tend to get funded. So hopefully this is about to change. I think that because catastrophic fire and uh, incessant drought has, has gotten so bad in recent years, I think people who generally tend to look towards more conventional remedies um, are opening to the possibility of like approaching um, climate mitigation and drought responsiveness in a more holistic way. Cool. So what would you say wetlands, that's an example of a green infrastructure. So what's a function that the wetlands does that we then try to build gray infrastructure for that function that the wetlands does, but really the wetlands probably does it better. Yeah, wetlands is like, it's the, it's the natural, wetlands are natural dams. They uh, collect water and beavers are instrumental in the propagation of wetlands because they slow the flow of a river and spread that uh, water out so that more of that water is being stored in the upper, sh upper watershed. And um, so wetlands historically were a source of uh, flood control. And they're also very functional in uh, providing water purification, nat natural purification. Uh, so a gray infrastructure solution for the natural, for, for what a wetland can provide naturally is um, dams and dikes and um, trying to build uh, walls <laughs> that separate human communities from the riparian zone. But um, honestly, these gray infrastructure approaches to uh, protecting communities against drought and floods um, they're kind of proving to be less cost effective than, than the natural solutions. Beavers are the best engineers nature has to offer and we can put them to work for free, Perfect. but it's gonna require a change in mindset or worldview that we live on top of nature into more of um, a position where we're living in interconnected way with nature where we're supporting nature's capacity to provide those ecosystem services such as flood control and water purification and freshwater delivery. So why would you say wetlands are better at flood control than dams? I'm not saying that. 
Uh, but I'm saying that's nature's solution. Mm. It's way it's the way nature slows, spreads, and sinks water into the upper watershed. It's um, so I guess. I mean, I do think there are reasons why it actually works better because, like, um, a dam, uh, because a dam actually holds. Well, one thing uh, when you have really huge uh, storms, like atmospheric rivers, where they're dumping a lot of that water, the dams can only hold so much. And then after the event, they actually have to um, release a lot of that water into the river and back to the ocean. And so um, they able the, the point of it is to store the water from the drought from the you know the big rainfall events for the drought season. But they're not able to do that because they have to go buffer zone. Whereas the wetlands, if you have it more decentralized it can actually go into the aquifers. And so the aquifers are huge, you know, they're a lot, they can hold a lot more water than the dam. So in that sense, I would say, you know, you have a lot more storage capacity in the aquifers than the dams. And so therefore you do actually store the water from the huge storms for the drought season. Okay, yeah, so sure, I see what you're saying. So it kind of wetlands encourages that natural percolation process and it stores the water underground as opposed to in surface reservoirs. Yeah. Which, clear, which clearly, uh, yeah, you'd rather, you'd like, I, I would think <laughs> if I were a hydrologist that I'd rather use the um, vast storage capacity of our subterranean uh, aquifers over a built surface water reservoir that costs a lot to maintain and didn't Oroville recent you know relatively recent uh risks and threats associated with the Oroville dam show us um the consequences of what can happen after so many years of deferred maintenance on these giant dams yeah and then I think yeah the wetlands are naturally more decentralized and so I mean, the rain when it comes down in huge storms is decentralized a bit. And so it's useful to, I think, have a source that's kind of more decentralized and absorbing all that rainwater. And then, um, and it's nice that it's combining the function of purification. So you're not having to have a sewage plant and a <laughs> dam, you know, you can actually have them all in the same thing. So, I mean, I think there's, you know, that's the multifunctional thing of permaculture. Um, so, yeah. And then also, I think it's, it, yeah, like it's just a natural part of the environment. So you're also encouraging biodiversity and there's the soil is not all stuck in the dam, right? It's it's still being utilized fertile in the whole landscape as opposed to all stored in the dam with doesn't get- Oh, it's, it's so true. That sludge and it that collects in a dam, all that sediment. Do you know how much money PG&E spends on- excavating that sludge and maintain it's like that sediment is it wants to spread out in the floodplain it that sediment it's only a liability because we've made it a liability it, we've turned what was an asset as mm -hmm. in as in sediment to create soils and collect in the floodplain um, into this giant liability that is extremely expensive for us to manage. And so, yeah, it's it's a complicated equation because we rely on so much hydroelectricity for our power supply. Um, but it just seems like there's uh, a better Well, the other thing that's what kind of wacky is that we spend huge amounts of electricity just to pump our water around. <laughs> <laughs> like so then we want hydropower but like why are we wasting all this water <laughs> wasting oh, all electricity just to pump it around right i mean i don't even know which one we do more we, do we generate more hydropower do we waste more money the water <laughs> it's a, that's a great point alpha low maybe if we <laughs> if we minimize the amount of electricity we need to pump water uphill in california um maybe that would completely cancel out the need for that dam. Yeah, because we really want to decentralize water. So that's what the small water cycle is. So like if you're, if you're collecting all your storm water instead of running away runoff, like then you can actually bring it up from the aquifers. And LA is starting to do this. They have this billion dollar project to, in Burbank to 
depave it and create a wetlands and I think nine other wetlands parks in LA to so really? that LA can because LA actually has enough rain even though people think it's really dry it has enough rain to provide for half the people in LA we're You're just not me. storing all that rainwater we're just wow. running it all off and uh and, and LA used to be a wetlands you know like Beverly Hills used to be those rivers and like all around there used to be wetlands and but we you know got rid of all the wetlands so anyway um yeah, yeah. LA used to be a lot more <laughs> rich <laughs> and lush um even though we now think of it as a desert that's because we made it a desert yeah um, and then we wouldn't have to pipe LA wouldn't have to pipe in so much water from Owens Valley and and drain that and make it the desert there you know and so it's kind of like that's why you want to decentralize it so that yeah and then uh so yeah so that and and yeah, and of, of course, all that soil from the dam that could be somewhere generating more, I mean, more soil and that soil could be storing the water from the rainforest for the drought season. So you have less droughts and then because it's more wet and hydrated, then you have less wildfires. And so it's kind of like we have to clarify how much the dams are actually contributing to wildfires and droughts. <laughs> like maybe if that was clearer to that whole issue, then, then, uh, yeah and then also the floods because like if you if the fires create soil waxiness then the floods flow down the hills and are much worse and so it's like this whole dam aqueduct and then the whole farm drainage system right where you're draining all the water out of the farms because they put pipes underneath the soil so all that water that could have been going to richer soil and just the richer soil absorbing is now drained out so yeah no california's water system is heavily overbuilt over-engineered and um, I like to think that this next chapter that we're coming into is gonna be kind of a relief where we're like, oh, like let's choose less maintenance remedies for these major issues. I mean- Well, I like this uh, framing that you have. I like how you frame it. It's like, we wanna go from gray infrastructure to green. I haven't heard this framing, but I like that framing. We wanna go from gray infrastructure to green infrastructure. And maybe if we can clarify the benefits the green infrastructure has over the gray infrastructure, especially it's multifunctionality, then, then maybe we could divert all that huge amount of money that's going into the gray infrastructure and to upkeeping the gray infrastructure. Like, Right. And it's it's more about it's rebalancing because, you know, I mean, some of the gray infrastructure upgrades are needed, like some of mm -hmm. these leaky pipes and, right. um, a, you know, like springs that, you know, I mean, in McLeod, we may need to dig a well. I don't know. I don't know how what the, the prolonged drought and lack of snowpack is going to do to our springs. But uh, the, the key is to just is to rebalance where so much emphasis is not so much emphasis is being put, put towards gray infrastructure and more of that is uh, veering towards green infrastructure solutions. And, and really, I, I feel like an underlying uh, requirement for that is to kind of address this uh, systematic devaluation of nature that our economy relies on. We've built our communities based on uh, the complete and total dis, uh, devaluation of nature. Mm. But over the past couple of decades, this concept of ecosystem services is starting to penetrate our cultural psyche. And we're starting to see uh, the way nature has provided these things we rely upon for free naturally since the beginning of time and we're realizing how our kind of intervening and intrusive technologies disrupt that the ability of nature to continue providing our communities with water clean cold fresh water for free <laughs> once upon a time now it costs quite a bit to maintain our water systems but um you know, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's a, feels like a big part of the puzzle. Um.